Hi, I'm Andrew Hilton, and this is my weekly economic outlook. The first, I guess, since the second round of lockdown started. Now, I really don't want to say anything about that, except, except that while the medical evidence for lockdown is disputable and indeed is being disputed, the damage that another lockdown will do to the economy, to prospects for the next generation and to general health outcomes, after all, COVID is not the only game in town, is all too real. Don't forget that about 2,000 people die every day in the United Kingdom. When you hear shock horror that 17 people died of or with COVID-19, bear that in mind. But whatever I might think of it, the coronavirus isn't where most city people's attention has been over the last week. Rather, it's been focused pretty intensely on the United States and specifically on the November 3 elections, which are now just, I think, 35 days away. It's hard to be objective about them, but let me try. First, the polls. <clears throat> the latest polls in the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal have Biden ahead nationally by eight and 10 points respectively. And he's also ahead in most of the key swing states, though Florida and Pennsylvania and Georgia are tight. True, Rasmussen, which is another respectable polling organization, has the national picture a lot tighter, but that isn't what has gotten Americans transfixed over the last few days. What has got every liberal's knickers in a twist is the possibility, which Trump appears to be encouraging, that he will not accept defeat if he loses on election night. Let me be clear. I think this is nonsense, but uh, Trump's opponents can lay out a reasonably plausible case, mostly based on uh, his well-known insistence that postal voting, which uh, we know from historical fact always favors Democrats, is inherently corrupt. The problem is twofold. First, that thanks to COVID, there'll be a lot more postal voting this year than usual. And second, that in most states, counting of postal voting cannot start until the polls have closed. That means that it is at least plausible that Trump will win on the night and will claim victory, and that that victory will then be eroded and ultimately overturned as the postal votes come in and are counted. Remember that the final count is open until January the 6th, when it's supposed to be endorsed by the old Congress, and that the new president is not inaugurated until January the 20th. Remember, too, that the old Congress will meet in a lame duck session in January, and that it can still pass legislation which still can be signed into law by the old president. That's a recipe for all sorts of shenanigans. And I can imagine Trump, if he loses, using that interregnum to uh, negotiate a blanket pardon for himself and his family from, from Biden. Uh, who would probably be inclined to, to grant it as Ford did with Nixon, even though it wouldn't go down well with Trump haters, either in Congress or in the press, but it would probably be the prudent thing to do and to do it quietly. Unfortunately, things are getting more and more heated. Uh, an article in the increasingly influential liberal periodical, The Atlantic, last week lays out exactly how Trump could mount what is effectively a coup. And quite a lot of people believe that that is uh, what he's up to, and they won't uh, be convinced otherwise, even though it's Senators McConnell and Rubio and half of congressional Republicans promise that they won't let it happen. Meanwhile, the Democrats are wasting a great deal of energy on this issue, while their national campaign is, according to Sunday's New York Times, languishing for want of a candidate who can actually address the issues that affect middle class voters. That is middle class in the American sense. We might call them white van voters or blue collar voters. In my opinion, it's a great misdirection play by Trump. The same is also true of the brouhaha over Ruth Bader Ginsburg's replacement on the uh, 
Supreme Court, which has suddenly shifted the electoral debate away from COVID and the economy onto social issues and the progressive conservative split in the US, where Trump is happier and where Republicans are likely to do better. Nominating Amy Coney Barrett uh, to the court is a deliberate red flag to, Republic, uh, to Democrats. There's no doubt that as far as the law is concerned, she's well qualified. Uh, there is equally no doubt that she'll be a justice in the conservative mold of Antonin Scalia, for whom she clerked. Uh, that'll push the court's center of gravity to the right, though it is as well to remember that judges who are appointed as conservatives tend as Chief Justice Roberts has already done, to drift to the left. Does it mean abortion will become illegal in the US? Categorically, no. But more power might devolve to the states. Does it mean that Obamacare will be repealed? Almost certainly not. But a new Republican administration might get to tinker with it. Despite that, I note that yesterday Trump uh, announced that the Affordable Care Act, which is what Obama is formally called, would be repealed immediately after the election and replaced with something, and I quote, far better and far cheaper. That sounds um, apocalyptic, but it's exactly what he promised when he was first elected and it never happened. The Supreme Court won't help him in that. More important, Will she get confirmed? This is where it gets really confusing. The Senate is going to take up her nomination immediately, but it has to go through committee first, and Democrats will try every procedural ploy to hold it up. If it does make it through committee to the full Senate floor in time, it certainly looks as though Republicans now have the votes to get her through. That's probably the base case, say 60% probability. More worrying, however, is what happens if the Republicans cannot get a vote scheduled before the election, which is, say, a one in three chance, and if the Democrats then win the Senate on November the 3rd, which is, let's say, 50-50 chance. Will the Republicans, for whom this is a once-in-a-generation chance to push back against progressivism, try to get her appointed by a lame duck Congress? Before the new Republican, uh, before the new senators actually come in after January 20th. It can happen, and it has happened in the past. However, it would be very, very contentious, and it would also be opposed by a majority of US voters. We'll see. The likeliest outcome, and in my opinion, probably the best, is to let her candidacy, candidacy go through on its merits now. The next president will pretty certainly get to pick at least one more justice, since Stephen Breyer is now 82 and not in great health. And Barrett's, after all, well qualified and smart and, and won't rock the boat, though I have to confess that her membership of uh, People of Praise, which is a small, I note, ecumenical cult-like group in uh, South Bend, Indiana, is a wee bit problematic, but it's not, you know, it's a, this is not, um, it's not even Opus Dei. Um, we will, it's, uh, that said, I did a little Googling on the court yesterday and discovered that um, if appointed, she will be the only Supreme Court justice not to have earned her law degree at either Harvard or Yale, which have four apiece. She went to Notre Dame, uh, which is solidly in the Midwest. And before that, she went to a small private college Rhodes College, which got me all excited, but it's not that Rhodes. Uh, with her on the bench, the Supreme Court will have five and a half Catholics and two Jews and no Protestants, except if when really pushed, Neil Gorsuch, who is, was raised Catholic and went to Catholic schools, but married a Brit when he was uh, at Oxford doing his DPhil and is now said to have attend Episcopalian churches in Washington. There's not a single wasp on the court, and actually there hasn't been for some time, nor is there an evangelical Christian, though they are the fastest growing Christian denomination in the US. 
You may think that's completely irrelevant, but Americans still take their religious affiliation seriously. There's one other big issue. Overnight, something else has been added to the plot. The New York Times, under its executive editor, Dean Basquet, has splashed all over its front page that it has obtained Trump's tax receipts for the last two decades and that it intends to trickle out their revelations over the next few weeks. This is, I have to confess, dynamite, and I assume Trump will try to go to court to block the times. As a result, therefore, the first set of revelations is probably the juiciest. They include first, the revelation that almost all of his businesses are losing money. Second, that he paid no federal taxes at all in 10 of the 15 years prior to 2016, and only $750 in 2016. And third, that he faces possible bankruptcy as a series of loans that he has personally guaranteed fall due in the next couple of years. This is huge. I think particularly the revelation that he paid less tax than the average Joe who actually voted for him. It's big. One more thing about the election. Tomorrow, Tuesday, is the first of three presidential debates. The general feeling is that Trump has made a mistake by setting the bar too low, by repeatedly implying that Joe Biden is senile. He's ensured that if Uncle Joe can indeed remember his own name and doesn't fall over, he will win. Trump is also vulnerable since Chris Wallace, who is the moderator of the first debate, will undoubtedly try to score points and using the, financial, uh, the New York Times data as a jumping off point, even though, or perhaps even because his day job is with Fox News. If Trump doesn't know the capital of Albania, for instance, Biden wins. The New York Times revelations will also be a crucial factor. No doubt the Times will have already briefed Biden's team on how best to use them to hurt Trump and his family, since one of the other allegations is of double dipping by Ivanka. Anyway, we'll see. I still think that it'll be a close election, but I'm afraid, for better or worse, Biden's going to win and the Senate will probably stay Republican. Have we learned anything more about the actual policies that either candidate will follow? Well, not really, though I know that one of Biden's foreign policy advisors did tell the Financial Times last week that he would, first of all, end the trade war with the EU. Secondly, that he would return to the Iran nuclear deal, which, frankly, I think a bit sceptical about. And thirdly, that he would limit arms sales to Arab countries, which goes down well with the Israeli lobby. No word on what uh, the deeply Irish Joe Biden uh, thinks about a US-UK free trade agreement, but I can guess. Let's turn to the economy. At a global level, the most significant revelations last week were the flash market PMIs, the Purchasing Managers Indices for September, which were a mixed bunch leaving China aside, which publishes its figures this week, uh, we saw the composite PMI, that is manufacturing and services, fall in the United States, in, in Japan, in Germany, in France, and here in the UK. And remember, that was even before most governments have moved into partial shutdown mode yet again. Things are not good, and they are getting worse. Let's look at the UK first. The fear here has clearly been on the, uh, the focus here has clearly been on the coronavirus with our Chancellor Rishi Sunak apparently fighting the good fight against the so-called experts uh, who demand total lockdown now. But whether useful or not, whether justified or not, we are facing new restrictions and they have already forced the Chancellor to push through more remedial measures, his so-called winter economic plan, which has a faintly Hitlerian ring to it. 
this, as you know, includes replacing the admittedly over-generous uh, furlough scheme with the German-style Kurzarbeit scheme in which the government will help out short-time workers, an extension of the four existing loan schemes through November, but no conversion, at least no conversion yet, of those loans into grants, and an extension of the VAT cut for the hospitality sector through next March. Will it be enough? Well, I also note reports last week that 16% uh, of UK SMEs have not reopened after the pandemic restrictions were lifted, that 10% uh, of workers are still on furlough, and that 25% of the tourism and food industries are close to or actually in insolvency. So the answer is probably not, hence the scrapping of the November budget, which may give the Chancellor time to cobble together yet another grand plan. This week also sees the Tory party conference when Boris Johnson must be grateful uh, that it's only virtual and that he won't have to face his critics face to face. In the meantime, it was reported that the public sector net borrowing requirement soared in August from under £15 billion to a record £35.2 billion, and also that the CBI's Industrial Trends Survey fell, fell in September from minus 44 to minus 48. On the other hand, at least according to Rightmove, uh, UK house prices were up 0.2% this month, which does suggest that the cut in stamp duty is having an impact. But all in all, it's not a very attractive picture. Plus, Bojo himself is obviously under stress, though I'm inclined to poo-poo all those Boris haters who are predicting a coup by Graham, Bade, Graham Brady's gang of 1922. Uh, Boris still has a majority of 80, and there still isn't another proven vote-getter in the cabinet. Still, I do note that Keir Starmer has finally overhauled the Tories in the polls. If only some of you might say there were an election. Well, there ain't. What about the US? Well, as the New York Times also said yesterday, the economic recovery, quote, has hit a wall. That is not entirely true. There were some positive releases last week. In particular, uh, existing and new home sales were both up in August, albeit not as sharply as in July. Uh, the Richmond Feds, there are a lot of regional Fed reports come out every week. The Richmond Feds manufacturing index picked up in September and durable goods orders were up 0.4% in August with non-defense capital goods orders X aircraft, which is what the markets tend to look at, up 1.8%. That sounds okay, but in fact, the durable goods order actually missed, that is, it came in below the streets, Wall Street's expectations. That was also true of the initial jobless claims figure, which edged up from 866,000 to 870,000 in the latest week. It was also true of the Chicago Fed's National Activity Index, which fell in August from 2.54 to 0.7 nine and the Kansas City Fed's manufacturing index which fell in September from 23 to 18 and also the Red Book retail sales index which fell 0.9 percent in August they were all pointing in the wrong direction on top of that real-time data collected by Bloomberg for travel and restaurant traffic is falling as a result, both JP Morgan and Goldman Sachs have cut their forecast for fourth quarter growth. JP Morgan, for instance, is now looking for an annual growth rate of just 2.5% in the fourth quarter. Goldman is a wee bit more optimistic at 3%. What about our friends in continental Europe? Well, there are some positive signs that at the Eurozone level, for instance, it was reported last week that the Consumer Confidence Index rose from minus 14.7 to minus 13.9 in September. 
Equally in Germany, which everyone agrees is doing best, it was reported that GFK's um, forward-looking consumer confidence index for October edged up from minus 1.7 to minus 1.6, big deal, and that IFO's uh, business climate survey for September hit 93.4, the highest level since March. That is significant. In France, Anse's business climate index was also up, and in Italy, Istat's business confidence and consumer confidence indices were both up sharply. However, things weren't so wonderful in Spain. As a result, the ECB is now arguing that the EU's recovery fund, about which we've talked before, should be made permanent and that it should be a regular support for vulnerable countries. That would have been that would would have been on the agenda for the scheduled EU summit last Friday, except that the Council President Charles Michel uh, tested positive and is quarantined, and the sub summit was postponed. As for China, whose economy is the only one amongst the major countries likely to show positive growth this year. It was no surprise that uh, last week the PBOC, the central bank, left interest rates unchanged at 3.85%. Why mess with a good thing? That said, there's no doubt that China is becoming steadily more assertive geopolitically, escalating its intrusions, uh, escalating relations with Taiwan by deliberately intruding into Taiwanese airspace. That said, in my opinion, it has still not done anything to upset the status quo, particularly in the Matsu Islands, which are right up against the Chinese mainland. When Beijing really does want to jerk Washington's chain, that is where it will start. As for global equities, well, September has turned out to be, as it often is, a difficult month. Last week, the Dow was down 1.8%, the S&P 500 was off 0.6%, and NASDAQ was down 1.1%. This side of the Atlantic, the DAX was off 4.9%, the CAC 40 was down, also down 4.9%. Our own FTSE 100 was off 2.7%, and in the Pacific, the Nikkei 225 was off 0.7%. Month on month, the Dow is down 5.2%. The S&P is also down 5.0, oh, sorry, is off 6%. NASDAQ is down 6.7% and our own FTSE is down 2.0% and so on. Indeed, the only major market which was up for September so far is the Nikkei, which is up just 1.4%. There are any number of reasons for this, but I think the US leads. And there, the concerns are primarily, first of all, fears about uh, an electoral stalemate. Secondly, the failure to push through another fiscal package, though Democrats and Republicans are said now to be talking about another compromise bill, perhaps around 2.4 trillion. Tensions with China and the new second wave economic curbs as a result of the coronavirus. Whatever, the VIX measure of volatility is up, the mood is bearish, and the fact that it is Yom Kippur uh, this week will guarantee thin and choppy trading. Certainly, uh, while US equities have been hit and hit hard, uh, the dollar has bounced. Two weeks ago, it was down almost across the board and experts were looking forward to a collapse. It had, after all, dropped almost 6% on a trade-weighted basis since April. Um, last week, however, it bounced. It was up 2% against the euro, closing at around $1.16 and 2. Um, it was up 1.8% uh, against sterling at $1.27 and change, and 1.1% against the yen at uh, 105 yen even. Given the uncertainties over the US election, that's sort of hard to explain, except that the dollar is almost always the safe haven of choice, even when the problem being protected against is actually caused by the US. Certainly, other safe havens aren't doing so well. 
gold, for instance, lost 5.1% last week, despite a prediction from City that it could actually hit a record by year end. And the Swiss franc, the, the other alternative to gold, is now subject to intervention, or at least a talk of intervention, by the Swiss National Bank to hold it down. What else? Well, the other big issue last week was trade. At the global level, the first round of consultations on who gets the uh, WTO gig, the World Trade Organization, eliminated uh, candidates from Egypt, Mexico, and Moldova, leaving, I think to some surprise, our own runner in this race, Liam Fox, in along with four others. Now, I'm still rooting for the Korean, but the favorites, um, and the job is to be announced in early November, um, after another round of eliminations, are Amina Mohammed from Kenya and Ngozi Okonjo Iwiala from Nigeria. Well, not exactly from Nigeria, since she took out American citizenship very recently, but it's almost as if she was Nigerian. The interesting question, at least to me, is whether becoming an American helps or hurts her candidacy. We shall see. There are two other issues in the trade area. First is TikTok, which uh, quite predictably um, got a ruling from a District of Columbia federal judge uh, to block Trump's decision to close down its US operations on national security grounds. Normally, that might infuriate the Donald, but in this case, it probably suits his agenda since it gives Walmart and Oracle and their private equity friends time to fine tune their bid for the US operations of TikTok. Though the whole thing could still be blocked by Beijing, which now has to decide whether the deal as it is proposed breaks its own rules on the export of key technologies, something that is learned from the United States. The second big issue is Nord Stream 2. This is another counterintuitive one with the most anti-American political party in Germany, the Greens, now seen as the only one backing Washington's call to pull out of the project. All the other major political parties agree that uh, with Nord Stream 97% finished and with $10 billion already poured down the plug hole, it is too late to walk away. It's an interesting one. Which way will Mrs. Merkel jump? I really don't know. As for the Brexit talks, the ninth round starts this week with France accusing the UK of intimidation. I like this one over Michael Gove's prediction that there will be 7,000 trucks lined up at Dover. Ho, ho. Uh, I still figure that some sort of deal will emerge out of the tunnel into which we're about to enter in time for the October 15th summit meeting. But what amazes me most of all is how far down the political agenda both in the UK and in the EU, Brexit has fallen. It may be an existential crisis for some, but for most, it's just another shrug of the shoulders. One last thing, the United Nations General Assembly opened last week with 182 canned speeches, almost all of which were utterly unmemorable. However, two stood out. First was Trump's completely predictable defense of his America first philosophy. And second was Xi Jinping's pledge, I put that in inverted commas, that China, which currently produces close to 30% of the global CO2 emissions will be carbon neutral. Again, I quote, before 2060. Can we take this seriously? Well, I doubt it. China still relies on coal for 60% of its power, and it is still opening new coal-fired power plants almost every week. Nevertheless, the climate lobby has hailed Xi's promise. Um, client Earth, for instance, insists that it shows real wisdom. Well, maybe. But frankly, a much more important development in this field last week was that California announced that it will ban the sale of all gasoline and diesel powered cars by 2035. At present, only 6.2% of cars sold even in California are electric, 
and only 1.6% of cars in the rest of the United States. As for this week, well, it's China's National Day holiday and the beginning of uh, Golden Week. Uh, on Wednesday, it is also Yom Kippur and the Tory party conference, so quite a trifecta. As far as economic releases are concerned, the biggie is, as it always is, non-farm payrolls. In this case, for September in the United States, they're likely to be up around uh, 875,000. Anything less than that will be a real cause for concern. Other than that, I guess we're going to be treated to continuing revelations about Trump's taxes and about Tory plots to oust Boris Johnson and how he's simply finding it impossible to make ends meet on £160,000 a year. Thanks. See you again next week.